Hey all, and welcome back to Sonic Rivals. We're here in Carnival Whatever Zone. I can't really be asked to look up the name. Maybe I will go to Sonic Retro and see all the levels I want to in a second. Uh, I, I guess we can start by talking about the people who made the game. Backbone Entertainment. Uh, they are known for doing a lot of uh, emulation in the Sonic franchise. They did a lot of ports and whatnot. Uh, let's scroll down here. Sonic and Knuckles. Uh, Sonic the Hedgehog 3, Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection, collection slash Sega Mega Drive Ultimate Collection. Uh, do, 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 do. They did like the ports of Marvel's Capcom 2, and so on. But uh, sadly, uh, they went defunct as of 2015, uh, which I'm not surprised because the last game they released was in 2012. And quite frankly, they're a very mid studio. No offense to anyone who lost their jobs and whatnot. I will say that out of all the Sonic ports and like versions that they released, they were among the weakest versions. Like the, they were doing the Xbox 360 and PS3 ports of the classic Sonic games, and they were fine. But like the interface was a bit of a mess, and they had some sound issues as well. So like if you if you're looking to play the classic Sonic games, then there are better versions available. Like I wish that Sega would just get along with putting the Taxman ports on systems people actually have, but I guess they're gonna still doing that for as long as possible. Well, you know, why do a good thing that might benefit your franchise? Let's just pump out another three hour, you know, boost of fun and maybe change the engine again for a couple of years and say the game had a four year dev time. Yeah, but like the thing is with the like the ports is that the Taxman ports are already made for one and two at least, so it's just like, give him a bit more work and he can just port them over to other systems and that's quite a small project that won't cost him too much. But, no, I guess they just don't want to for whatever reason. I mean, part I don't know whether it's something that I have actually seen or whether it is just pure assumption or whatever, but I feel like I have seen and it, there is a li potential likelihood that there's a little bit of, uh, I suppose, difficulty there between Sega and Taxman and sort of stuff that's developed, potentially, in the sense of, obviously, all of the well-received Sonic games have come from people who are fans and sort of like Taxman doing the ports of Sonic 1 and 2 and so on and obviously the Sonic Mania team and obviously I can imagine Sonic team getting a little bit jealous of that uh, I don't think so the, the, it's, a, it's one of those things of saying it's a possibility I'm not saying it is I feel like I saw something that said that that was a rumour eh, whatever um, but it is. A, I wish that they would just sort of, you know, just suck it up if that is the case, and just let people have what they want. Well, see, the thing there is that I do recall there being a bit of bad blood between Sega and Stealth, like when the Mania port on PC came out, and he was quite pissed off that they'd added the De Nuvo DRM without telling him. Yeah. And like that was a bit shitty on Sega's part, but I feel like in terms of the intercompany like drama so to say i i think sega probably don't care if it would make them money Fair. Like, that, that just doesn't seem like a business kind of thing to be bothered by like maybe when it's among smaller indie devs like i know sometimes the shit kicks off but i would think that sega if they just think okay we can commission these guys to make this port or we release this or whatever and it will sell easy enough then that seems like the sort of thing that you would just do I mean, you'd think so, but then also certain business people can be very, very petty when they want to be. And there is definitely evidence, not Sega specifically, but there's definitely evidence of uh, developers and publishers being very petty over the years. So obviously that's a, if it is the case, if it's not the case, then yeah, there's absolutely no reason whatsoever for not doing it. It just makes sense. Like both in terms of gaining some goodwill back for the franchise, but also in terms of money, which most businesses generally tend to follow. Yeah, it might also be a cultural thing because 
like, as far as I can recall, Sega America and Sega of Japan have always had a little bit of, uh, I would say, a bit more intense than a rivalry. Like, I would say they were at each other's throats sometimes. Well, you do see that between, like, regional kind of things, like Atlas are the fucking worst for that, and now they're under Seiko. You can kind of see that maybe that's carried over a bit, but, you know, like, I, I feel like they could be maybe something there, but, again, like, in business money talks, like Rick just said, and I would think that, you know, like, even if individuals are being little shits about it, there would be some guy in a suit to say, you know what, we need to please our investors. Well, what why if the guy at the top was that petty guy and just didn't care? <laughs> that is a possibility, yeah, to be fair. Now, at this stage, to bring us back, I will say this one is a bit different to all the others in that there's only the two acts for this. There's not, like, two acts and a separate boss because this is sort of a boss in itself in the fact that we're rather than racing one of the main rivals, we are racing Metal Sonic. Yeah. And it does break the formula they've built up a little bit, especially given later on we're going to have a Metal Sonic race and then a standard boss, so, like, <laughs> I don't know, like, they're making up the structure as they go along, but, you know, we get to see Metal again, and Metal Sonic's one of my favourite Sonic rivals, so, yeah, I'm cool with that. There you go. Well, are you talking about, like, Sonic rivals the game, or just a rival to Sonic, per se? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, Rich, I don't know if you'd agree with me, but these two carnival levels, both aesthetically and level design, seem a bit above the other ones. Do you think that's just a placebo effect on my part? Um, I don't know whether it's placebo. I think they definitely do seem quite a bit better, but I think that part of that is because one, carnival levels tend to be visually more interesting than forest levels because you can do more interesting things with them. So you've got like the big tops and Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also the colour palettes that you can go with are a bit more in varied because you can go for like these reds, you can go for like the dark blues, you can throw some neon in there and visually that is more interesting. I do also think that from what I've seen so far it does appear that they have thrown in a lot more, well, a better variety of camera angles in specific moments. So it seems like the levels are just a bit more engaging, yeah. I suppose. Well, visually, at the very least. Yeah. Uh, the level design itself is kind of annoying because this is one of them levels that has spikes fucking everywhere, as you've seen from the amount I've run into. But I think in terms of like the levels look it's the red filter that makes this look a lot more striking overall i don't tend to be that big on these kind of levels like, i've never been too big on the harsh reds so i will say that the second world we're going to in this part looks a lot better in my eyes mm. but i do realize that that's a very subjective thing <laughs> i mean i think harsh reds and oranges can be unpleasant sometimes or a little bit overbearing it, i think it really does just depend on the level and the vibe that you're going for obviously if it's a lava level then you're basically going to get reds and oranges um but I, I suppose part of that is it's the sunset aesthetic i suppose mm. um that tends to sort of lift certain levels up higher than they perhaps would have been otherwise I feel like when it comes to the brighter colours, they work best when they use subtly, not a filter over the whole fucking screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as much as I like Spyro Reignited, there's a purplish filter over a lot of stuff which I don't really understand. Yeah, I, I feel like this is even worse in this situation, given it's much lower res, so you can't really do as much subtle, like, colour tones as you can with a HD game. Yeah. Like, and if you think back to a lot of sprite-based games, they would tend to keep those colours reserved to like the player character, more so than the backgrounds or the environments. Uh, I feel like that was 100% by design, just so it didn't overwhelm the player. Oh yeah, I mean, it, it basically what that is, is it's colour theory and figuring out how to make the player character more vis 
visible against the background so you know who you're controlling. I mean, even in 3D games, that is an important thing to consider. I mean, so... Obviously, a bit of a side step, but a good example of that is Bayonetta, because obviously the central issue that you can run into with Bayonetta, because her design is based, she's entirely dressed in black, is it's very difficult to then put her in a kind of black, um, dark setting, um, and like one of her initial designs was sort of. Very much in line, I suppose, with what her Bayonetta 2 outfit was. Um, that there was just a lot of hair going around sort of the body. You couldn't really distinguish her all that well. So that's why she ended up with the whole sleeve situation and the two red ribbons, because it highlighted her sort of against everything else. But also, if you notice, all of the enemies that you face are kind of whites and sort of more the royal colours and Bayonetta sits firmly in the blacks and dark reds and purples so you have that immediate distinction of who you're playing versus who your opponents are and all of the levels and areas were much more I suppose muted in the colour palette Um, and when it moved to Bayonetta 2 and everything got a lot more colourful because everything got a lot more colourful Bayonetta, the black of Bayonetta's outfit still stood out. Um, so, in a situation like this, obviously you need to make sure that your characters are easy to spot so you can control them. I wonder if that's why they broke up uh, Shadow's black coloration with red spikes or streaks, rather, because Sonic's just all blue, except for his arms and belly. It's possible, but also. It makes him look edgier, which is kind of it. like if they're going for a dark Sonic, which is what his conception basically was. Like you know, it's I guess having the red count as Sonic's blue. Yes, I mean there is that. I mean I I will say that I do strongly suspect I've got no evidence for it that the red spikes there will have been a gameplay reason for it. Because if you look at Shadow's design, you remove those red kind of stripes on him, he becomes very difficult to read in terms of what he's doing. Yeah, this goes back to the Bayonetta stuff, etc, etc, etc. We talked about, like, fucking colour theory in a Sonic game for a while now. Uh, Frame, tell me how it feels to play the game. How's the game feel, for lack of a better word? Okay, so... How would you describe a 30 FPS game with input lag? Because that's how this is. <laughs> I would describe it as un- unpleasant, to say the least. Yeah, that's what's going on here. It feels like the characters, they have a bit of delay on like you pressing the button to like them responding and jumping or moving or whatever you're trying to get them to do. Knuckles nearly overtook me at the end there, which was why I was shit scared I was going to lose. But <laughs> yeah, it... It really is a clunky game to play, and a lot of the random getting twatted kind of hits that I've taken throughout this are more from, like, the thing comes on screen, you press the button like you would in any other Sonic game, not bearing in mind the fact that you need to press it a little bit earlier than you may be expecting. And, like, the frame rate itself, it mostly stays to 30 but for a racing game where there's a lot of like twitch reactions it really could have done with being higher yeah i guess so like i doubt we're gonna see remasters of the rivals games anytime soon <laughs> because the, peop- the people who made them don't exist anymore they're just gone but uh yeah i understand what you mean from my uh time playing the games i think i only played through rivals one and two once but it was enough it was enough. You got the point. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't think we're getting Rifles HD. Although I would pick that up and play it just on principle, you know? <laughs> well, it might rub a bit of salt in the wound if we get them before we get the Taxman Classic Sonic Remaster. So. <laughs> this feels like a very... I don't know why I went so high there. Oh, this is so high you played a Sonic game. This feels like a very Western sort of Sonic kind of thing to yeah. me. I don't know. Maybe it's just like the way things are together. So I wouldn't expect it. I'd expect something uh, like Rush being remastered than I would before Rivals. But this is going back to the whole 
Western versus Eastern uh, bad blood thing. I don't really have any evidence for that, so... I suppose that one of the things that would be interesting is to... St so I agree that I don't think Rivals really stands a cat in house chance of ever seeing a remaster or a re-release of any description. Um, but I would say that that is probably more in part of it's just... It's a really forgotten bit of the series. Nobody really cares about Rivals. Whereas there are people who care about Rush. There are people who care about Unleashed. And those sorts of areas of the... Well, and also you've got the Sonic Adventure fans as well. Um, those games stand a better chance overall of seeing a re-release of some description. And I think that it makes sense purely on the basis of more people like slash engage with them than rivals. Um, but also there's kind of more to them... If you look at it that way, like, Rivals is just a very... There's n there's hardly anything here. Why would you bother? Well, I mean, I think, like, us talking about the fucking colour theory of the game and so on is uh, a testament to the fact that there's not a lot of content here. Why is that cave shaped like Eggman's mouth? <laughs> <laughs> Same reason that every one of his bases looks like him. He just, he's got to put his mark on everywhere that he works. <sighs> I guess so, yeah. He's very egotistical. Oh, wait a minute. Are we in the midst of developing a little plot twist here? <laughs> I don't know. Have you been reading what they're saying? <laughs> um, a little bit. I, I know the Master Admiral got turned into a playing card. So is Knuckles going to pay the inflated price on eBay for that rare card or not? Uh, I, I wouldn't get singles, honestly. I prefer to buy booster packs. Yeah, well, see, that's more expensive if you're looking for a particular card because it's down to luck, and especially buying off eBay when all the packs are weighed, you know. <laughs> what? So, Onyx Island. Uh, it's a future version of Angel Island that was brought back in time by... Uh-oh, spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> Does it have the Crystal Onyx in it, though? <laughs> Uh, sadly, no. That was, that's got to be like one of the earliest examples of like a regional variant that I can think of in Pokemon. <laughs> it's got to be the earliest example, or the only example of something memorable from Orange Islands. Look. Uh, um, I will challenge you on that, because there are at least more than a few things that are memorable in the Orange Islands. Like, I'm pretty sure there was the uh, pink fruit island where everything turned pink. Um... Also, you know, Ash actually winning something. That never happened. <laughs> Interestingly enough, the next time he won a tournament, it was also a set of islands. Ah. Yeah, and it was also the one series where like, I completely dropped off, so I didn't even see the build-up to it, but eh. You should go back and watch it, because the finale of Sun and Moon is pretty good. Yeah, I did start watching Journeys, actually. It's kind of interesting what they're doing with it, although, like, I imagine we'll end up talking about this more when we're doing Pokemon next fucking week. <laughs> like, we're just that impatient to talk about Pokemon. We're just, like, ignoring the fucking Eggman JPEG in that mech pair and getting straight <laughs> on with it. <laughs> I mean, at this point, like, it's just, it's an Eggman JPEG in a sort of weird polar bear rat mech thing. Yeah, if he was going for Polar Bear, he came out with, like, Mole or something. Yeah, but it's not even like an actual Mole, because it doesn't look like a... I'm not sure what creature this is meant to be. No, it's it's got this weird sort of look to it, and he's really lucky that Silver and Sonic are stuck to this 2D plane, because it doesn't look like that's particularly mobile. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it, like, implied that it drove out of the cave to meet them? Because it looks like there's a big enough space in there for it to do so. Yeah, that's like the garage for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it makes sense, then. There's not really much of a base behind it. It was, it was just his garage all along. Oh, wait, no, I'm seeing a bunch of rocks in there. Where the fuck did this friend come from? Uh, well, I don't know, like, he could probably drive over it. It looks like it's got decent treads on it. Silver wins, Sonic loses. R Robotnik is defeated, but Sonic still loses, I guess. 
Also, Sonic was just there going, no! No, porque, Maria! Ah, Black Oak, my favourite Sonic character. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you got the flame gloves and you got the flame shoes. <laughs> yeah, we're going to make Shadow look so fucking cool at the end of this, I swear. <laughs> Hell yeah, going to go to Flame Eternal. I didn't even realise Tails was in this game. Maybe I should have been reading the dialogue. Um, also, maybe they should have, you know, had a bit of a thing before they went with that particular character model for Tails, because Jesus Christ, he looked AP. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. I mean, Sonic's doing the pointing his finger at literally everyone he encounters, so that's kind of the same sort of problem. I suppose so. Yeah, from Knuckles to Knuckles. I think it just means it's Angel Island from the future, mate. Yeah, but is that going to make sense to Knuckles? No. No. <laughs> well, to be fair, this was still slightly gullible era Knuckles rather than fucking idiot era Knuckles, so maybe it is down a chance. You mean no personality, Knuckles? Basically, like, I don't like how they've completely shat over Knuckles' character in recent years. Like, granted, it is worse in Boom, which is an alternate universe than that, but... You know, like, there was a, there was something there with the idea of a character who's strong but a little bit gullible rather than he's a strong one so he's also stupid. I suppose ultimately it ended up being one of those things of well, sitcomification, I suppose. Like, if you look at pretty much every sitcom that has lasted for a long period of time, the characters begin being somewhat complex to an extent, um, but as time goes on, they end up becoming more and more of the stereotype that they sort of originate with. The term is flanderization, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, Basically, like, obviously Knuckles began as slightly gullible, strong echidna. I'm going to give you a heads up, Richie. We don't have time to discuss the history of Knuckles' character right now. <laughs> no, I, I am aware. But yes, went from sim kind of fun to idiot. Yeah, so Eggman's a card. So whoever we've been dealing with isn't the real Eggman. So I guess you'll have to join us next time for the finale. Yep, it's that short of a game to see what's what. See you next time. Bye-bye.